put a new perspective on church for me that night. Anyway, last week we spoke about how God draws us to develop an intimate, growing relationship with him. And the question is, how does this happen? When I started thinking about this, I remembered a trip I took last summer. I was able to uh, go to Europe with about 350 young people. And we saw all the great sights. One thing that really stuck in my head Fine. There you go. Painting is called Light of the World. I can't tell you who painted it. I can't tell you when it was painted and all that good stuff like that. My wife, who was an art major, she could tell you right down to what kind of brush she used. But it's at uh, Keble College in Oxford. And I remember this because it's very telling for me. <clears throat> Pardon me. Based off of Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in him and will dine with him and he with me. Look at that picture. What do you notice about the door? No handle on the outside. That door, tell it too much in this light, it's overgrown, wintered, it's weather beaten, but the only handle's on the inside. Amazing thing is, the creator of all universe stands outside knocking for us. And that's how we have a growing love relationship with him because he takes the initiative. It is all possible because God chases us. He created you for a love relationship with himself. This cannot be a one-sided affair. This relationship needs to be real and personal to you. He wants you to know him, worship him, but most of all, he wants you to love him. John 14, 21 says, whoever has my commands and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. You want God to reveal himself to you? You must love him and obey him. John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commands. The Bible says something once, it's important. It says something twice, it's super important and we really need to pay attention to it. When you obey Jesus, you show that you love and trust him. Obedience is the outward expression of your love to God. John 14, 31 says, but I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. He was obedient to every command the Father gave him. His love for the Father was demonstrated by this obedience. A love relationship with God requires you demonstrate your love by obedience as well. Not to the letter of the law, but to the spirit of the law. If you have an obedience problem, you have a love problem. You tell God, I love you with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. If I were to summarize the Old Testament in 34 words, it'd be Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. This heart cry of God is expressed throughout the Old Testament, and the New Testament's the same. Jesus quoted Deuteronomy in Mark 12:30. 
and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. There you go again, it's being repeated. Really need to have our antennas up and tune into this. Everything depends on this. Everything in your Christian life, everything about knowing him and experiencing him, everything about knowing his will depends on the quality of your love relationship to God. That's not right. Nothing in your life will truly be right. Look what God says about a love relationship. Read these verses this week and really kind of meditate on them and think about them. Deuteronomy 30, 19 through 20. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, holding fast to him, for he is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. John 3.16 is probably one of the most famous verses, okay, in all of football. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. John 14.21, whoever has my commands and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself in him. Romans, <clears throat> pardon me, 8.35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. First John 3.16, but, but this we know love, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Finally, 1 John 4, 9 and 10 and 19. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son in this world so that we might live through him. In this love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. We love because he first loved us. Love relationship with God is more important than any other single factor in your life. Do you really want to love God with all your heart? He will stand for no competitors. This is stated in Matthew 6, 24, Deuteronomy 6, Matthew 6, 31 through 33. Shows that he is a jealous God. He wants us and us alone. Out of his love for you, he'll provide all else that you need when you love him and him alone. And God is the one that takes the initiative in this love relationship. And it's evident all throughout the Bible. He came to Adam and Eve. He came to Noah, he came to Abraham, Moses, the prophets. Jesus came to the disciples. He chose them. He came to Paul. Sin has affected us so deeply that no one seeks after God, okay? Romans 3, 10 and 12, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. I think it's an amazing thing about this is he comes to us not as friends, but when we're his enemies. Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I think a lot of people in this world forget that. None of us deserved it, but he came looking for each and every one of us. And this is never clearer than with Paul. 
known as Saul, he was actually opposing God. Jesus came to Paul and revealed his father's purposes of love for him. We do not choose him, he chooses us. Christ confirmed that in uh, John 15. If I can find it. You do not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Because he chose us, we're all supposed to be different. That's a hard thing to do sometimes in this world. Yeah, remember, okay, Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say I am? And they answered, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah. And he said, who do you say I am? Peter answered correctly, you are the Christ. And Jesus says something very significant. This was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. In essence, what he's saying is, Peter, you're blank as a chalkboard. You could never figure this out on your own. The only reason you know this is because it's been revealed to you by my Father. You're responding to my Father's activity in your life. Good. Do you realize that God determined to love you or you would never become a follower of Christ? He had something in mind when he called you. He had begun a work in your life. He took the initiative. When we respond to his invitation, he brings us into that love relationship with himself. Philippians 2, 13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. 1 John 3, 16. By this we know love. He laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. First, we started with, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. The relationship God has created us for is not just for time, but for eternity. Time is here and now, okay, and it provides us the opportunity to get acquainted with him for him to develop our character and his likeness. If you live just for the here and now, you're gonna miss the ultimate purpose of your creation. The here and now will allow your past to shape and mold your life. But the difference are you're a child of God and should have your life molded by the future. God uses this time to mold and shape your future usefulness here on earth and in eternity. Our past should not have a limiting influence in our lives today. Paul struggled with that. Philippians 3, 13 and 14, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. More than anything, Paul wanted to know Christ. Let your present be molded and shaped of what you're to become in Christ. And you start that by placing your life the purposes of God. Make sure you're not investing your life and your time and your resources in things that are not lasting. Make sure you're investing in the right things. If you do not recognize that you're created for eternity, you're going to invest in the wrong direction. Okay, Matthew 6 says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. <clears throat> God created Adam and Eve for that love relationship. And when he sinned, God knew something happened. Can you sense the heart of a loving father when scripture says he's in the garden, he says, where are you? Inform. 
When your relationship is as it should be, you'll be in fellowship with the Father, anticipating that relationship of love. When I have my quiet time with God, I'm not there in order to have a relationship. I'm there because I have a relationship. Time with him enriches and deepens the relationship I have with him. Morning. I guess it was like 4.30 I got up for my quiet time. I'm always sitting there saying, God, you know, am I, is this right? Is this what you want me to talk about today? Is this, is this what you want somebody to hear in this congregation? Opened up my scriptures. I permitted myself to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I permit myself to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here am I, to a nation which did not call on my name. Oh, good. What God wanted me to talk about this morning, because somebody out here needs it. I take that back. We all need to hear this at times. God wants the relationship to be real and personal. He wants to speak to us. Can a person have a real, personal, practical relationship with God? From Genesis to Revelation, we see God relating to people in real, personal, intimate, and practical ways. Adam and Eve, intimate fellowship, restored the relationship, provided a practical need in clothing. Hagar, used, mistreated, and abused by Sarai. End of a rope. God knows her needs. God saw her. God enters into that relationship. Lovingly provided, very personal. Solomon, heritage of faith and obedience to follow. As for a discerning heart, again, very practical. Twelve disciples, totally real, personal, and practical. What a pleasure they had to be. Peter in prison, awaiting execution, answers to prayer, delivered, dramatic, and practical. If you read your Bible, do you sense that God became real and practical to people? I mean, you look at it. Was it practical for Noah, Abraham, to Moses, to Isaiah? Yes, all the way down the line. And has God changed? Nope. It was true in the Old Testament. It was true during the life and ministry of Christ, and it's true today. Your life can also reflect that kind of real, personal, and practical relationship as you respond to God working in your life. I know some people say, but Pastor, what you're suggesting about doing God's will is not practical in our day. And I would agree with them, but then we'd both be wrong. God is very practical God. He was in Scripture. And he's the same today. When he provided manna, quail, and water for the children of Israel, he was being practical. When Jesus fed the 5,000, he was being practical. God revealed in biblical times is real, personal, and practical. And I trust God to be real and trust practical with me too. And if for some reason you cannot think of a time when your relationship to God has been real, personal, and practical. You need to spend time evaluating your relationship. It may come the realization that you never entered into a saving relationship with God. And if that's true, really take this time to settle that most important issue and respond to his invitation. People want to experience in the heart what they know in their head. We respond to this invitation when we accept the fact of God's loving, God's love being demonstrated to us through the cross. The cross is a once for all statement of God's never ending love for you and me when he died for our sins. By his love, God has provided us with the opportunity to know him personally. We come to know him, come to know him personally through trusting his risen son, Jesus our savior. But having come to know him personally, he invites us to know him intimately. He invites us to know him in an intimate love relationship. God's desire is that our chief motivation in our daily walk with him be a growing love for him. 
I mean, when it comes to your friends in life, you look for those people that just want you when they need to borrow something, need to have you do something for them. Really look for that friend that just enjoys being with you, just enjoys your person. When you go to God in prayer, is it always because you need something? His faith and his presence just because you love him. That's God's desire for us in our relationship with him. Love him and want to be with him. Not a vending machine where you insert two prayers, okay, and you get your answer. I once read a question at a Baptist hospital so I signed. They said, will your life be a mess or a message? What would you have your life be, a mess or a message? What will be be determined by how you daily respond to God's invitation to love him, join him, and know him? Even the smallest step of obedience is a giant step towards blessing. What step do you need to take today? I sat here and read all these scriptures throughout the week, and I prayed about it. A lot of people want to argue with me that we have to do something in this relationship. Scripture shows us he's come after us. That should make each and every one of us feel so stinking special that the creator of this world chose you. Once we realize that, it should be special enough for where we just want to get to know him. Yeah, we're going to have our prayers, okay? Trust me, I've used a lot up in the last couple of weeks, okay? Lord, help my hip. Lord, help the doctor have a steady hand. Importantly, know your savior. Get to know the creator of this world. Father Almighty. Been around from senior members. They tell me that they've been married for so long, sometimes they take their spouse for granted. That is very good advice for a young couple. Never take your spouse for granted. But how many Christians take their relationship with Christ for granted? A relationship, guys. You really need to focus on that. Join me in prayer. God, you've shown us again the deep meaning, total necessity of a continuing love relationship with you. Thank you that you love us so much. Forgive us when we fail to spend time with you each day. We commit ourselves right now to spending time every morning with you before we start our day in other pursuits. Continue to pursue us, Father, and show us how to express our love to you in real, personal, and practical ways. Let us be fully aware of the real personal and practical ways you're expressing your love for us. We worship you. We serve you in time and in eternity. But please grant us the love we need to love you the way we should. Father, give us that love we need to love others as you call us to. And we pray this all in the powerful, saving name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.